Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Timothy and chapter 3. 1 Timothy and chapter 3. You may recall uh, last time that uh, we spoke from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. Train yourself for godliness, it says in verse 7. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. We spoke on that passage about spiritual fitness, the importance that we need to be growing in the faith, feeding on the word, following good doctrine, training for godliness, pursuing the right thing and valuing eternal life and persevering with hope in gospel ministry and that we have a hope in life, gospel hope. And this all centres, we saw, on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the mystery, the revealed truth of godliness, as it says in chapter 3 and verse 16. At the prayer meeting, uh, following that uh, service, we looked at the 12 times that the Apostle Paul uses the word godliness, or a <clears throat> form of that word, in First and Second Timothy. The Greek word uh, has a meaning similar to our word religious or religion of piety, devotion and reverence towards God. What we believe and the behaviour that follows uh, godly living. The word religious comes loaded, doesn't it? Outward rituals, uh, often without any inward change. And it was the same in the first century used a false religion more than relationship with the true and living God. Paul uses this word uh, through this epistle and the second to Timothy as well uh, to contrast true religion, uh, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the mystery of godliness with the false false teachers uh, preaching another gospel, one of good works and material gain. Today I'd like to take a closer look at this revealed truth, this mystery of godliness, which we find in chapter 3 and verses 14 to 16, and to see how it relates to the local church and to us today. So let's read that passage together. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 to 16. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let's pray and ask God's blessing as we consider this passage this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this revealed truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel and we thank you for your son the Lord Jesus, in whom we believe, in whom we have life. We pray now as we consider this passage together, Father, that you would bless and teach us and help us as we consider. May the Holy Spirit himself uh, be teaching us your word today. And may that word uh, bear fruit in our lives to your glory and to your praise. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a, a pivotal section in the letter that Paul writes to Timothy. He, he's writing to Timothy, who's overseeing the church at Ephesus. And as we said last time, some had come in <clears throat> and were teaching different doctrines. As it says in the first chapter and verse three, contrary to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he hopes to visit Ephesus and Timothy, as he says in verse 14 here. But there's delay in his coming. And so he writes... And this is all in God's providence because we now have this letter which we can read ourselves and benefit greatly from. The purpose for writing is that Timothy and we may know how one ought to behave 
or live our, our conduct in the household of God. And the Apostle Paul here in verse 15 gives three descriptions of the church. And that's what we want to think about first this morning is the church's identity, as we have in verse 15. He says, if I delay, you may may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. That's the first, which is the church of the living God. That's the second, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The third, the church's identity. Identity is important. Who am I? Who are we? Our characteristics, what makes you, you and me, me, is one of the most fundamental questions that we ask. Who am I? And identity is important to our belonging. We're all created with human identity as image bearers of God. Created to live in community with each other to the glory of God. But we know from the Bible's account and from our own experience that sin has broken humanity. The fall of Adam and the fall of, fall of humanity. This uh, community and our living together is, is broken. Our relationship with God is broken. But... Praise be to God who sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem us, to save us. And so Christ is restoring our standing before God, our relationship with him. And we see this in the church. He is creating a new community in himself. And so Paul's descriptions here correct uh, misunderstandings that we may have about what the church is. The church is not an organisation in that sense, or a political entity. It's not a a business or a social club for those with religious preferences. No, the church is God's family, God's assembly, and God's building. And it has God-given identity and purpose. So we see in this verse... Firstly, God's family, the household of God. The word household has already been used in this chapter in uh, verses four to five concerning the qualifications for an overseer. It says he must manage his own household well, his own family, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household How will he care for God's church? And also concerning the the deacon as well. In verse 12, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own, own households well. And then later in chapter five, uh, we see again the, the term household there used concerning the widows. In uh, verse four, It speaks there. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. And uh, down in verse eight as well, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And also down in verse 14 as well. So I'd have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households and give the adversary no occasion for slander. We see this uh, description of the households and the very practical needs that were there in these households and in these contexts. And, And so in the church as well, this is the same word used here. It is the household of God. How we live and conduct ourselves in this family. We're all different, aren't we? Different backgrounds, with different personalities. But we're all brought together by God into his family and we're learning and growing together. We belong as his people, as he saves us and brings us together to God's family. 
And this is a wonderful truth, a wonderful privilege to share in this family likeness with all the benefits that go with it. It's not a, a free for all. This is God's household, his authority over his house. Fallen society uh, opposes authority or abuses authority, which leads to breakdown. And we see the effects of this, even ourselves. But godly authority builds up. And this we see here, the church is God's family. But also it's God's assembly, as the verse says. It is the church of the living God. That word there, church, is assembly, gathering, called together from every nation, reversing the effects of the fall and of Babel, which happened later, where people are scattered across the earth. This new community is being gathered together in Christ the church and here we have the living God who manifests his presence here because this is the church of the living God this is Old Testament imagery God dwelling with his people as we see in the Old Testament with the, the tabernacle and then later the temple God dwells amongst his people and so the New Testament church bears the glory of the living God in Christ. And life is seen, the living God is seen in his church, his gathering. It's God's family, God's assembly, but also God's building, as the verse goes on, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Here we have building imagery. And we're familiar with pillars, uh, upright supports that holds up the building. But a buttress, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that word. I had to look it up to see what it meant. But it's a, 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 a part of the building that strengthens and supports the building. And if you have been to a cathedral or a large church building, you would see them perhaps on the outside uh, of the walls as the walls go out towards the ground. It's those, there's that, there's the buttress which supports the structure. Other translations translates the word as foundation or ground. But it's that that supports and holds up. And it's the truth that is held, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Gospel truth is in view here. And God is pleased to use the church, his church, his assembly, his family, to uphold before the world, to promote and protect the truth of the gospel. In this context, as Paul writes to Timothy at Ephesus, it's, it's the error that's there to be repelled by the truth of the gospel. And in the context of the first century, as the gospel advanced through the known world, through the proclaiming of the gospel, backed up by transformed lives. It's this what is in view here. The church is to be a pillar and buttress of the truth. And so the church's identity is seen here. And the church's identity is Christ. This is clear from other epistles that Paul writes as he writes to the churches in Christ. For it's in Christ that the family of God is called, gathered together and is built. There is no church outside of Christ. As the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm reminded of that hymn we know uh, by Samuel John Stone, written some 150 years ago. And the first verse says that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And with his, his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. 
the church identity is Christ. And this is an exclusive claim. And as this text as well, as the household of God, the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth, here are exclusive claims, which excludes other religions, other ways so called to God. There's one family, one assembly, one people of God, one church, one truth, one Christ. The mystery of godliness, the revealed truth of God in the Lord Jesus. This is contrary to modern thinking, which says all religions are the same. There are many ways to God. But Paul writes to Timothy and to us here to affirm there is one saviour and one church. If you just turn back to chapter 2 and verses 4 to 6, we see there that Paul writes <clears throat> that it's pleasing in the sight of God our saviour who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. There is one mediator, there is one saviour, the man Christ Jesus. Have you come to this one mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he your saviour? Is this your identity? As we've been speaking about these things this morning, can you say, yes, this is my identity in Christ. Yes, I'm a part of this family, this assembly, this gathering, this building that God is working in this world. I am in Christ. I am saved. Is this your identity this morning? If not, would you come to him today? Would you forsake your sin and turn in repentance and faith to Christ and become a child of God in Christ Jesus, be brought into the family of God in Christ? Christian, this morning there is great privilege to be a member of this family and responsibility. This is all of God's grace that he adopts us brings us into his family as sons and daughters of God that we can cry Abba Father we have an identity a belonging in this family and we have an inheritance reserved for us to know God that he gathers calls saves not based on <clears throat> my performance but on all it's all of his grace in Christ and so we share in this family likeness together but as in all families we're all different aren't we we share the same family name but we have different temperaments different attitudes different abilities different maturity we don't always agree but yet God is working in us to bring us into the likeness of his son. Also have a responsibility uh, to gather together as a, a local expression of, of the whole church, which we are a part of. It is hard at the moment uh, as we come out of lockdown, as we there's much regulations to work through and as we're, we're working on reopening the building so we can physically meet together. It will be a joyful time, won't it, when we can finally assemble together and worship our God as the assembly of God's people. But also the truth of the gospel has been entrusted to us. Every local gospel church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Not the, the bricks and mortar, but you and I, as members of the church, and we have a responsibility to uphold the truth of Christ in our conduct, in our words, 
in our speech, in our actions, in our attitudes with one another and before a watching world. As we recently concluded our, our book study in, in the Pray Big book, but you may remember uh, and some uh, commented on this uh, section where it spoke about God's glory, his perfections which are invisible are made visible in the transformation that he has brought about in the lives of ordinary redeemed men and women. It said this glory is meant to become tangible to people when they encounter a church, as they see our love, our faithfulness, our compassion, our goodness, forgiveness, as we seek to to love one another in this fashion. God's glory is seen. What a privilege, but what a responsibility we have as the church of the living God, the household of God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. But praise God, he does not leave us to our own devices. He's given us his word and spirit to lead and direct. And so God works through ordinary means and ordinary individuals even you and me in the process of calling others into his family to gather his people together as the truth is shared so we see here the church's identity but then in verse 16 we also see here the church's song the church has a song to sing And hymn singing is important in our worship, setting biblical truths to music in praise to God. We affirm our faith as we rehearse these truths together. And here we have, it's supposed, a first century hymn or part of it. It has a distinctive structure, almost like a a creed. And the translators have sought to preserve the poetic form of these words. It's clearer perhaps in the Greek, in in the format of the words and the endings that are used. You can imagine the early church uh, joyfully affirming these great truths as they met together. There is debate about how these lines uh, relate to each other. Is it simply chronological? Or are there parallels between the lines? Is it uh, three stanzas as the NIV sets it out, or is it two as the ESV lays it out? But the basic idea is clear. Here is a hymn, here are words declaring the glorious truth of the gospel of Christ, the mystery of godliness, what we affirm and what we believe. And so let's just quickly work through these words here this morning firstly christ's earthly ministry the first line speaks of his incarnation he was manifested in the flesh here we have the christmas story manifested he appeared what a wonderful fact this is that god in the second person of the trinity took to himself human flesh to become the god man truly god and truly man. Why? Why was this necessary? That Jesus needed to be fully human in order to be our substitute and also he needed to be fully God in order for his obedience and suffering to be perfect and for God's justice to be completely and eternally satisfied. What a wonder this is he was manifested in the flesh but the second line uh, says that he was vindicated by the spirit here's a response to the first line from humiliation to exaltation he's pronounced righteous and all through Jesus's sinless life he has proved to be the promised messiah but it's at his resurrection which is in view here that we see Jesus vindicated as he's risen from the dead. As it says in Romans 1 and verse 4, declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the third line here, seen by angels. This carries on the thought of vindication. Angels are not common. They, they, they come at key moments in the New Testament. 17 uh, appearances there, six at his birth, Jesus' birth, and then at the, his temptation at Gethsemane, the resurrection, his ascension. And then also as the gospel advances in Acts as well. But here we have the post-resurrection appearances seen by angels, signifying uh, the victory and triumph of the risen Lord and his ascension, which the angels observed as they witnessed here the king of glory. And so these first three lines could be summarised as Christ's earthly ministry. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit and seen by angels. And then the second stanza here seems to parallel the first as it speaks of Christ's ongoing ministry. And it's through the church as the pillar and buttress of the truth, as we've seen in verse 15, that, that Christ's ministry now continues. So we have the fourth line here, proclaimed among the nations. This seems to complement uh, line one, as he was manifest in the flesh, now he's proclaimed far and wide to the nations and here is fulfilment of the Old Testament promises. Uh, the gospel is, is, is sent out to the Jews and the Gentiles, to the nations. This is Paul's mission. This is the church's mission in the New Testament. And this reflects uh, the desire of God as we read in chapter 2 and verse 4. The Lord who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here is the evangelistic mission of the church, which Paul embarked on, which was breathtaking. The truth, of, the truth of Christ is and will be proclaimed. The church is witness to Christ and proclaims this truth. And in verse 5 uh, is a response to that line, uh, believed on in the world. It also echo, echoes uh, line two in the first stanza as well, where it speaks there of Christ being vindicated by the Spirit. Here he is believed on in the world, as many are brought to life in Christ by the Spirit. Here we see an effectiveness of the gospel and the Spirit's work. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is active, granting the gift of faith Working miracles of grace in many lives, uniting men and women, young and old, from all nations to Christ. And it's through the preached gospel of Christ. He is the content of this message. He is the one whom faith is placed in. It's relational. For Christ Jesus, as it says in chapter 1, verse 15, came into the world to save sinners. And then... We have finally the sixth line here, taken up in glory, which seems to parallel line three, expanding on this glorious thought, seen by angels, taken up in glory. Christ here is exalted. Reference, no doubt, to his ascension, but the focus here is on his present reign in glory. Christ is ascended. And he is reigning at the Father's right hand. And it's through the present reign of Christ that the church accomplishes her mission. And we're to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ as he ascended, as he reigns. So he is coming again to bring us to himself. What a wonderful hymn this is, the church's song. And this is our song. 
isn't it? This is our song of praise, uh, our opening hymn this morning, uh, Glorious Christ, picked up a similar theme, the big sweep of God's redemption, the big story which we're a part of. As we sang together in the second verse, it speaks of Christ who left the air of heaven to breathe the dust of earth and dwell among the outcast and the poor. You came to be forsaken and die to take our curse so you could be our joy forevermore. And you're seated now in heaven, enthroned at God's right hand. You've shattered death and freed us from our fears. And though we cannot see you, you're coming back again. And all will be made right when you appear. You are the glorious Christ, the greatest of all delights. Your power is unequalled, your love beyond all heights. No greater sacrifice than when you lay down your life. And so we join the song of angels who praise you day and night. Glorious Christ. This is our song. This is our song of praise this morning. And truly we sing, don't we? Glorious Christ. This is also our song of testimony. Do you see your testimony as a song? I'm not saying that we uh, should sing to our friends or to our neighbours or in the high street. But our lives, our conduct, our words, our, our witness should sing of Christ. There should be an an attractiveness in how Christ is seen in us. Not speaking here of being seeker sensitive in that way. As with the identity of the church, as we saw, so of each line of this hymn, there are exclusive claims made here, which is offensive to the proud and self-righteous. The truth of the gospel isn't compromised. But the offence is with the gospel message itself and not with us. There should be an attractiveness in how Christ is seen in us. Do we sing in our lives? Is our testimony a song of Christ? And so we also find ourselves here in this story and in this song. As those who have believed on Christ in the world and as those who now proclaim him among the nations in the ordinary, in everyday living, in our everyday encounters, in our relationships, being sought and light in the world. This is our song of testimony. This is our song of faith And how important it is to know what we believe. As Paul encourages Timothy here in the church, he directs us to Christ. We are rooted in the revealed gospel truth of Christ. So this morning, we're nourished. We're built up. We're encouraged in Christ. Not in how we necessarily feel, but in the reality of the gospel. What we know and what we believe, what we affirm, what, the, what God has revealed to us. This revealed truth, the mystery of godliness in Christ. And here we have our song of faith. We can rehearse this song, can't we, to ourselves and, and, and sing the gospel to ourselves. This is our song of hope, finally. What's your view of Christ? This hymn finishes affirming the glorious Christ who reigns. He reigns over every detail in our lives. Over our hopes. Over our fears. Over our plans and over our delays, over our trials, 
over our everyday lives. He reigns. Do you see the glorious Christ this morning? It is in him that we are to trust. And as he was taken up to glory, in glory, and as he reigns, so will he return, as he promised, to bring us to himself and be fully vindicated. All things will be made new and a glorious future awaits the church in Christ. This is our future in Christ this morning. And we look to our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord help us and bless us as we consider his word and as we trust him this morning. Let us pray. Our Lord, our God, our Father, we thank you and praise you for your word to us. We thank you that you are gathering a people to yourself. A family. You're bringing many sons and many daughters to yourself. We praise you for this is all of grace. It's not of our own doing. It's not of our own abilities, but it's all of you. And so we praise and worship you today. We're very conscious of the responsibility and, and the privilege that you've given to us as the church pillar and buttress of the truth. Oh, Father, we pray that you'd help us today. Father, to, to, to know what we believe, to rest in Christ, but also to be sharing, proclaiming this truth in our lives with others. Oh, this is hard and you know the difficulties and the challenges that we face. But Father, we pray that you would enable us and, and give us opportunity and grant us boldness and faith. And Lord, we thank you for this hymn here, this, this song of the church which we have. We thank you for the, our glorious Christ, your son, our saviour. We praise your name that he was manifested in the flesh. That he came to be our saviour, humiliated unto death, even the death of the cross. Oh, what a wonder this is. That we praise your name, that he is vindicated by the Spirit. That he was seen by angels. That he is risen from the dead. We praise you, Father, that the gospel is proclaimed among the nations. And, be and that Christ is believed on in the world. And all around the world, there are faithful churches that you are establishing that worship you in spirit and in truth. We do lift up to you this morning those who are persecuted for their faith and who face many challenges and difficulties. We pray for our brothers and sisters and we pray, Father, that you'd help us to see uh, the church in its wideness, but also to recognise that we are a local body here as well. So help us, we pray to live out the gospel and Lord that we would display the Lord Jesus Christ as the church in this area and we thank you that our saviour reigns that he is seated on the throne we thank you we have a great high priest a mediator who intercedes for us and that he is coming again for us Oh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us and bless us as your people today as we rest in these truths. May we be truly nourished and built up in Christ, we pray, that the eyes of our hearts may be opened wide to behold our Saviour and to truly rest in him. And those who are hearing this message who are yet unsaved, Lord, we pray, have mercy, we ask, and draw many, many to the Saviour, we pray in our families, and in our uh, neighbourhood. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen. <laughs>